let's talk big picture. You started off as Dell Computers. Now you're Dell Technologies. I used to think of you as being first this uh, super efficient PC maker, then sort of a superstore for all things IT. How do you define Dell Technologies now? We see Dell Technologies as the essential infrastructure company. And so if you think about what's going on right now with the fourth industrial revolution, the internet of things, the digital transformation, there's a whole new infrastructure required to be able to support the amount of data and analytics and artificial intelligence, machine learning, to be able to serve up all the insights required. And new computing models, software defined, cloud, virtual, and by combining together, Dell and EMC and VMware, and Pivotal, VirtuStream, RSA, SecureWorks, Boomi, and a few other of our friends, we've created the essential company to provide that infrastructure for the future. You've got a lot of different pieces, and there was a time a decade, decade plus ago, where it was Dell, HP, IBM, say, in the running to be this massive hardware scale player. The others have sort of dropped out, in a sense. Uh, certainly when it comes to playing in consumer as well. You're still there and you're private. How does that position you differently from the others? Well, we love being private. It, it's, we have an advantaged financial structure and we're able to focus on long-term outcomes. And I think if you look back to the go private of the company in 2013, we've had 17 quarters in a row of gaining share in our client business. We continue to gain share in our server business. And we see a similar consolidation occurring in the rest of the data center as well. So we think we're quite well positioned and certainly with the breadth of capabilities that we have, we're unparalleled in terms of our ability to provide a broad range of capabilities to customers. And we're seeing customers respond very positively to that. I think you make the argument that Amazon and other cloud providers are just one piece of the picture that uh, say 90% of what a customer does if they sort of understand what their workload is going to be should really be not in a public cloud environment if they want to get the best bang for their buck. Is that right? You know, we see cloud as not a place but as a way of doing IT. Mm -hmm. and what it really represents is moving the workload up to the application layer and taking out a lot of the cost of managing inside the silos. And there actually are many different kinds of clouds, right? There's the public cloud. Amazon, Google. Exactly. I mean, lots of people have public There's clouds software now, right? as a service, uh -huh. right? Which is a, another kind of cloud. There are managed services. There's private clouds, hybrid clouds. We don't uh, see this as a, as a place, but a, rather as a way of doing IT. And we have a lot of experience in selling billions of dollars of equipment to all these public cloud companies. Mm -hmm. What they did that was different was they used software to manage at the application layer. Okay? And it turns out that that very same software is finding its way into on-premise systems. Mm -hmm. And there's a process where customers are modernizing and automating their on-premise systems and making them extremely competitive. So don't assume you get the best deal going with Amazon, Microsoft, Google. You're saying you, you got to pencil it out? Well, look, I think customers will have choices, right? And there'll be arbitrage opportunities. Uh, what we believe is that it's a multi-cloud world. So there will be workloads that are appropriate for any one of those various scenarios. And we certainly see the on-premise systems continuing to be a very important part of the overall market. And we're driving a consolidation there, mm. just like we have in the other parts of the business we've been you know, a big part of for a long time. One of the things you're announcing at Dell World is a sort of pay-as-you-go model that doesn't require people to go to the Amazons, the Microsofts, the Googles. You'll put the equipment where they want it, whether it's on, you know, in their offices, in their data centers, or, or in a third parties and say, okay, but you, you're only going to pay for what you use at the time. If this is popular, it could change the whole landscape of how people 
uh, are paying for cloud services. Why are you doing it? We've been gradually embracing this for some time, but we talk about this as consumption models. So pay as you grow, pay as you use, pay per use, and we're absolutely embracing that. It's what our customers are asking us to do, and, and we're, we're happy to do it. You know, we set up Dell Financial Services almost 20 years ago now, mm -hmm. operating in most of the key markets around the world, and this is really a pretty natural evolution for us. And traditionally, Dell Financial Services would be, okay, like we'll, we'll help you finance buying this server, putting it where you want to put it. But no, in we this still case, do that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, but in this case, we'll help you finance uh, not just buying the server, but paying for spinning up the service. It's even less risk on the customer, right, and more of the of the capital expenditure that you're taking on. Do you feel that's something that a public company could have done, or are you uniquely positioned to do it because you're private? We, we definitely have an advantaged capital structure. Uh, there's no question about it. I mean, I think. If you know our results are are actually public, right? So anybody yeah. can see our results, you know, gap and non-gap, and it's a little confusing with some of the you know software accounting that 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 uh, you know uh, you can have experts that understand far far better than 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 the two of us. But but the point is that uh, our results are volatile in the upward direction, and so we're taking we're taking on risk that. Uh, most public companies aren't apt to take on. And we're making big bets, right? What's an example? Well, I think if you, if you step back and look at the last uh, four years, the amount of share that we've gained in the kind of traditional businesses of, of Dell in, in client and server is pretty staggering. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, as a privately controlled company, we were able to uh, buy EMC and control of VMware, take it, take EMC private, and then combine it with Dell to create a totally new company. And but it's been, it's been four years, so you can reach back a couple years and give me some tactics that you're able to go out with and say, you know, if we were to do this, it would have screwed up a quarter or two and the shareholders would have gone crazy. But now <laughs> we can do this because it's the right thing to do. Sure. So, you know, look, if, if you go back and look at those 17 quarters, if you look at the 17 quarters prior when we were private, when we were public, you saw much more of a sine wave. And, you know, now with, with being a private company, it's 17 quarters in a row of just growth, 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 growth every single quarter. It's persistent investments in innovation, in research and development, in outstanding products and services, and additional sales capacity and partnerships to be able to grow. Mm. So we're going to spend a whole bunch on building up the sales force, take the hit now, but we know it's going to grow us, so we don't care. And we're still doing it. And, and, and you know, the, the, the time horizon is, is longer, much longer. So what, what, what's the answer for businesses now and how they do the calculation? How do you own enough of the data center to get the cost savings of not you know, paying the premium to Amazon or Microsoft or whomever, but have, you know, give them enough responsibility or somebody else enough responsibility that they can handle security, they can handle you know, the, the, the human costs that have ballooned in many cases. You know, I don't want this to come across as we're anti-public cloud, okay? So, so No, sure, you, you sell know, them a lot of stuff. Exactly, and, and, and we have partnerships with many, if not all, the public cloud providers. Mm -hmm. But what we believe is that there's an appropriate workload for those environments. And when you modernize and automate the on-premise systems, for the predictable part of the workload, I'm going to say that's 85 to 90% for most organizations, you'll find the on-premise systems are extremely competitive. We've, we've seen a, a bit of a boomerang effect where you know, customers have run to the public cloud and say, hey, wait a second, this is more expensive. And there's also a bit of a lock-in. The right. public clouds have created a developer environment that's really easy. And mm -hmm. they want you to use their database and all their developer tools. Now with Pivotal, we have a cloud-neutral developer-ready platform. And across Dell Technologies, developer-ready infrastructure. 
So you can develop those cloud native apps, run them in any public cloud that you want, uh, and also run them on premise. Dropbox is one of the ones that went to the public cloud and then came out. Well, it, you actually see this with almost every leading software as a service company. And what they figured out is that it's actually too expensive to be in the public cloud because the operating costs of the infrastructure itself is too large of a cost relative to their overall you know, P and L. And so, so what do you think when you see Snap? They're going to spend $2 billion on Google over five years. I guarantee you we could save them some money. Uh, it, it's not that hard. The math is not that hard. And so what I would tell you is, is a, uh, it, for the predictable portion of, of their, their workload, now, how much is there? There's predictable. I'll say you know, eighty percent probably predictable. Right. Uh, but a a IT person that stands up today and says, "Hey, we're going cloud first, and everything to the public cloud," I would not be surprised if in about two years uh, they find themselves uncompetitive. So. Another dimension of, of uh, competition and strategy is what's happening in the broader geopolitical environment. I know you've been to D.C. once or twice over the past few months. Um, the Trump administration has a different take on a number of things than the previous one did. Uh, when you look at manufacturing, PCs and servers, you guys, as you said, are gaining share. You sell a lot of them. Um, what would it take to move most or all manufacturing of that type back to the U.S.? We're having those discussions with the administration and sort of sharing our experience around the world in terms of what do other governments do to attract not just the final uh, production of a product like a server or PC. By the way, we have manufacturing today you know, in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. But if uh, you were talking but, scale, most or all back here, do you think it's possible? Well, so what you have to do is you have to get the components, <laughs> you know, the component manufacturing, because if you're just trying to make the finished products and you're importing the components, it's going to be incredibly expensive and not, not so efficient. So there's a lot of you know, work going on, good, good work, I believe, that could bring some of those component industries back to the United States, but it's going to require a specific strategy by the United States government to attract those industries. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they left for a variety of reasons and look, we're in a competitive marketplace and you know, if the U.S. wants to bring those industries back, it's got to have a deterministic strategy to do so. Do you think it would be a good idea? Well, I haven't seen enough of the, of the, the proposals to, to, to be able to really answer that question. But on the quality line, uh, you know, in terms of the communities here in the U.S., would it be a plus? I think it could, could certainly be a plus. I mean, uh, what you also see when you go in these factories today is there actually aren't a lot of people there. Right. The, these factories are more about capital equipment and technology and less about labor. And arguably there'd be probably fewer people involved who were to come to the U.S. because labor's more expensive, so. You, you would likely automate even more. On immigration, um, is this administration on the right path, you think, as far as how they're talking about it, some of the policies? We've seen um, some moves toward H-1B visa reform, for example, or are there course corrections you would make? There again, you know, we are engaged in, in the discussions and, you know, the H-1B visa issue for the highly skilled talent is particularly important to our company and our, and our sector. Uh, you know, w we think immigration reform is an is, is important part of, of, you know, moving the economy forward. Positive thing I can tell you is that this administration, this president, is very focused on growth and creating jobs, and you know, I see that as only good news. Um, do you think in your lifetime 
Dell will ever be a public company again? <laughs> uh, well, you know, we have two public companies sure, already you've got, within, within Dell Technologies. You've got pieces that I'm are I'm a pretty young yeah. guy, so my lifetime is a pretty, know, pretty so long time. Yeah. So, so uh, why don't you ask me again in five or ten years? Okay, so it's a never say never type situation. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think it says about the state of the public markets that... You're thriving, doing so well as a private company, granted with public components, but for a long time, you know, we've thought that at your scale, multi-billion dollar uh, company, of course, you would want to be public. Well, let's do some basic math, okay? <laughs> it, as, as a public company, Dell and EMC together spent roughly five and a half billion dollars a year on share repurchase, interest, and dividends. Okay. Our interest expense as a privately controlled company for all Dell Technologies is about $2.2 billion. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the, the uh, share repurchase and the dividends are not tax deductible. And so the tax affected difference uh, makes being a privately controlled company in the interest rate environment in which we've been able to finance the company extremely attractive. And certainly for you know a company founder such as myself, uh, you know couldn't be more happy <laughs> to, to 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 be in the situation that we're in. So, look, I think it's given us uh, tremendous flexibility. There, we're we're not against you know public companies or you know the public markets play an important role in, in in helping to finance the growth of companies, as did they for our company. Mm -hmm when that was the way that you needed to get the capital to grow. Uh, but you know, we, we, we feel like we're in a great spot and certainly it's uh, unleashed you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of capability to expand our, our business in, in ways that would have been more difficult as a public company. Let's, let's go back down memory lane a little bit. It's been almost five years since Carl Icahn tried to get Dell from you. I consider what you have been able to maneuver and build since then to be uh, an undersung story in the history of te technology. I mean, in retrospect, it's just amazing, A, to get out from under that sort of a, a move from Icon, but then to be able to buy EMC and grow on this, this growth uh, trajectory that you have. How important was that moment five years ago, you think, when the history uh, of Dell is written? I think it's uh, incredibly important. And, and it, it was a lot harder to go private than it was to, to buy EMC and, 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 and gain control of VMware as well. Uh, but uh, it, it, it was absolutely worth it. Did you ever think you might lose the company? Yes. Uh, I didn't think it was a high likelihood, but uh, th 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 there were definitely some difficult and awkward moments. How did you deal with that possibility? Who did you talk to? Well, I, I spent a lot of time with with some incredibly skilled lawyers, <laughs> and, and uh, you know they they, they 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 were very helpful. Spent a lot of time talking to my wife. You know, my my my, my wife has been my my best friend. My counselor, my partner, you know, uh, for 27 years. And so th th that's, that's been an, a, an important uh, pillar for me in, in getting through challenges like this. Uh, you know, we had a great team and you just kind of power through it one day at a time. And, uh, you know, we, we, we made our way through it. But, you know, if I looked at the, the headlines and some of the incendiary things that were said, you know, d during that period, there was a lot of nonsense out there. And, you know, the, 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 I don't think you ever did this, John, but I think, I think there were some media that sort of reverberated on itself. And, you know, there often they, is, they, yeah. they were, you know, they were creating news where there was no news. And, you know, that's obviously uh, a, a, a bad thing to be doing. Did you always know what Dell the company, I mean, it's your name, what it meant to you, or did the experience of possibly losing it drive that home in a different way? 
I always knew what it meant to me and, and you know, was determined to see it through and see it to the, the success that we had imagined. And it's been all that and, and more. So you were 19, what, 33 roughly years ago in your dorm room, freshman in Austin, coming up with Dell, building PCs. What do you think today's Michael Dell in a dorm room somewhere is building? It's probably not a PC. <laughs> yeah, it might be a little late for that. But, uh, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, I think, look, we're, we're in an incredibly exciting time in terms of you know, artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning, unsupervised learning, the fifth generation cellular network, the digital transformation, the internet of things, all the security challenges. You've got sort of this Cambrian explosion of opportunity that is tremendous. And if you think the last 30 years have been exciting in technology, I think the next 30 years will, you know, make it look like child's play. It's so would you place a bet? Would it be AI? Is that what the next Michael Dell is is hacking on today? Yeah, I, th I think you have to do stuff that you're actually incredibly passionate and excited about and you know something about, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't, you know, the, the opportuners don't do as well as the entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and so I think, I think you have to really believe in what you're doing. So it's less about, hey, I think this is going to be hot, so I'm going to go do it, and more about this is what I'm really passionate about. I'm just going to push on that and see where it takes me. I, I believe it, it excites me, it interests me, and I've got an idea, right? <laughs> is that how you still run Dell, or is it different now? Yeah, well, you know, it's a big company, right? So yeah. we've got 147,000 people. We've got, we've got a lot of talented people. In many ways, it's a lot easier, mm -hmm. right? Because we have, we have a, a, a system by which we're creating new businesses and... It's not, it's not, uh, there's, there's, there's no single point of failure in a, in a company with this scale. But the stuff that you personally focus on, because you've got stuff that you can delegate and stuff that you can spend a little bit more time on, what's your stuff? I love spending time on our strategy and our products and our you know, services and our, you know, with our customers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love, you know, developing our people and making sure we have the right uh, you know, capabilities and talent growing inside, inside the company. Uh, you know, and uh, all those are sort of intermixed. You know, when, when you spend time with customers, you're spending time on the strategy mm. and, and the products because your customers can tell you an enormous amount about what their challenges and opportunities are, and that informs the strategy. How much time do you spend on stuff that's probably not going to yield anything for five to ten years? You know, I'd say we, we, uh, we, we have uh, a, a fair bit of time on, I'd say, more two to four years out. You know, I don't spend much time on the <laughs> five to ten years out. The, the, you know, our industry is incredibly difficult to predict when you get out five or ten years. Sure, we're placing some bets on some interesting new areas and things. Our Dell Technologies Capital Group is out there constantly, you know, investing in those futures. And those are, you know, those are uh, things that we, we, we think about in terms of how does technology evolve. The fifth generation cellular network is a great example. You know, it's not coming so you can talk on the phone faster, right? Right. <laughs> we're, we're talking about hundreds of millions, billions of data devices at incredibly low latency, that's gonna, gonna create a whole different kind of cloud. And the infrastructure required for that in terms of software-defined networks, security, and the amount of data that's gonna be created, and then you overlay on top of that all this new computer science, like the artificial intelligence, tremendous opportunities get created there. But you're That's not out what we there. get excited about. You don't have your own version of the driverless car, right? Google has been hammering away at that for, gosh, more than five years. Um, it's still not something that you and I are, are going out buying fully formed uh, from a car dealership. That's not really... 
Well, I think there was a DARPA contest 13 years ago with the driverless car. You know, yeah. it got, got a little better, you know, by 2005. Uh, so, look, I mean, there's lots of interesting projects out there uh, as far as driverless cars. What we're focused on is the infrastructure, the connected car platform. Pivotal is the operating system for the digital transformation, the Internet of Things, and cloud native apps for most of the leading car companies in the world mm. and, and a lot of the automotive supply chain and the large industrial companies, you know, healthcare, insurance, banking, retail. Uh, so, you know, uh, we, we've got across the Dell Technologies family uh, pretty broad participation in what you think of as the industries of the future. So we were just talking about 19-year-old uh, Michael Dell and, and imagining what he might be doing today. But actually thinking back, what were some of the mistakes, pitfalls that you made early on where if you had the DeLorean and you were going back and, and, and talking <laughs> to yourself, you'd be like, eh. I mean, it all worked out fine. So I'm sure you don't want to like create a wormhole and, and, and change history or anything. But what, what are some of the things that you would say? Hey, watch out for that or don't, don't care so much about that. Yeah, we, we, made, we made a lot of mistakes, and fortunately, none of them were so big that we couldn't be sitting here today. Right. Uh, you know, we, we, we learned a lot by trial and error. You know, uh, started the company with $1,000 uh, a week before I was taking my final exams as a freshman. Well, maybe that wasn't such a good idea, but, you know, when you're, when you're 19 years old, you haven't developed all the, the, the skills you need in terms of judgment and rational thinking. You know, we, we made mistakes around inventory management and supply demand and trying to create new generations of products and designing in things. And, you know, we learned from that the importance of inventory management. And we kind of went from a bad mistake that caused us to stumble to having an extraordinary capability that was a wellspring of growth and success for a long, long time. Hmm. And so, you know, look, I, I think... Uh, that's, that's the growth of just-in-time manufacturing, which was the original Dell Magic, was from screwing up the management of your inventory? That's right. And, and you know, when you're, when you're doing new things that have never been done before, you kind of have to feel your way through it and, and, and make mistakes. And... The faster you can make the mistakes and correct, not make the same mistake over and over again, well, your learning cycle, continuous improvement is only going to be accelerated. Where do you think a kid gets that mindset that allows not failure and depression, but failure and learning and moving forward? Where did you get it? You know, I, I, I probably got some of it from my parents. Uh, you know, they let us experiment and, you know, take things apart. And, you know, they didn't, I, I love to understand, you know, electronics and I would always take stuff apart. You know. I know you said your dad would, would bring a calculator home and that was amazing. What are the things that you were tinkering with? Yeah, well, he, you know, he had this sort of like a pre-calculator. It was like an adding machine, you know, and you'd punch in the numbers. I'm like a little kid, you know, and I'm watching the numbers come out and I'm like fascinated with this incredible machine. And then you saw the beginnings of the semiconductor revolution, you know, when I was just a couple of years old, right? <laughs> and and uh, you're sort of watching, oh, you can do math problems with these things and incredibly complicated. You know, that was very exciting. And my, my parents, you know, didn't, didn't discourage us from, from those kinds of things. I think, I think, you know, what, what I've seen is most people, unfortunately, only access a relatively small portion of what they're capable of hmm. because they're afraid. They don't want to take risks, don't want to make a mistake. And, uh, you know, uh, I think there's too much risk aversion generally in, in, uh, in, uh, you know, people wanting to go and, and do new things. So if, if you look at uh, people that, that have, have accomplished a lot, I would bet you that they're, they're taking uh, more risks and are less afraid of failure than, than others. And 
you know, I, I wasn't uh, the smartest kid in my high school, right? <laughs> You weren't the dumbest kid in your high school either. I, I, I did okay. Were you, were you involved in a lot of stuff, um, different activities? I, I, was, I, I was interested in computers and, you know, I liked, I liked uh, science and, you know, uh, cars and that kind of stuff. So I was, you know, somewhat typical kid, although computers were, I was sort of at the early end of that. But <laughs> every, every paper I wrote in high school, I wrote on a computer, you know, at that time that was sort of, you know, no, no, nobody knew what that was. Sure, the early 80s. I mean, could you even print it out? Yeah, yeah. Dot yeah. matrix printers? Yeah, we had, uh, <laughs> we had uh, dot matrix printers and, and daisy wheel printers yeah, if you wanted to yeah. make it look like a typewriter. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you were, you were tinkering with things, are you, are you talking more cars here that you were taking apart and putting together? You said you were into that? You know, um, well, I got I got uh, when I was in I was in a, a seventh grade math class, and we had this thing called number sense. So I wasn't on a track team, <laughs> wasn't on the football team, not wasn't on the basketball team. I was in the number sense club. Nice. Okay, We're talking real <laughs> geeky, nerdy stuff here. So what we would do is we would. We, we would calculate things in, in our head, you know, like multiply three numbers by three numbers and, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we'd get, you know, compete with each other and go to contests and things like that. So this math teacher got a teletype terminal, okay? So you'd write a program, send it off to the big computer in the sky, the answer would come back. So I was pretty fascinated by that. This was really before the personal computer showed up yeah and then you started to see the microprocessor based computers and this was all around the time i was in you know junior high school high school and uh you know uh i was just fascinated by that stuff so i just threw myself in, in into that learned everything i could uh you know bought a personal computer you know ultimately tore it apart you know figured out how it worked they were simple back then because you could actually learn how each chip functioned. And you could get a book, right? And it would tell you what actually happened inside the circuit, inside each you know, uh, chip. Mm -hmm. And you could build your own circuits and play around, and upgrade them, make them go faster. And you know, I, I, I was doing all that stuff. And it was enormously fun and interesting. Yeah, and that reminds me a lot of some of the programming capabilities that kids have now. I mean, even if you're looking at virtual reality, most people don't have the whole setup at home, but now kind of through the internet, you can, uh, you can send code off to places and do, that's interesting, I hadn't seen that parallel before. Where did you learn management? At first, you start the company, it's mostly just you, eventually you've got people working for you, and you're young. How do you get up to speed? Has, you know, learn by making mistakes, uh, I would actually call it leadership. <laughs> uh, so, look, I think I think uh, you know a leader is somebody that other people want to follow, and so you have to think about well, how do you motivate people, and how do you get them excited and engaged? And you know, I hired some great people, eh, hired some not so great people too, you know, <laughs> but but we asked them to leave, you know, fairly shortly thereafter, and. We gradually built, you know, a a uh, great capability to be able to to you know uh, lead the organization forward. I would tell you that our our initial success was uh, more on the strength of the business model that we created, and less because we you know were leadership you know gurus or something, right? <laughs> we 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 were making all kinds of mistakes, but. Look, I, I was fortunate enough to hire some really great people, you know, a guy named Lee Walker that helped me very early on, another one named Mort Topfer, another one named Kevin Rollins, you know, all sorts of people at various times uh, of the company. We had a fantastic board of directors, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, people helping me. I, you know, went off to various courses to learn, read a bunch of books, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you learn by making mistakes. And uh, you know, not making the same mistake over and over again. <laughs> Are there some books that jump out to you 
as being particularly influential for you? Oh, you know, uh, uh, Ram Charan, you know, wrote a whole series of books. He still continues to write, you know, great, great management books. You know, Larry Bossidy wrote a number of great books about, you know, management and leadership. And so I studied and learned from the masters. And I remember one time I was in, uh, uh, I, I, I t went to Stanford for a couple of weeks to take a, a course on leadership, right? And, and uh, how old were you at that time? I, I tell you exactly, I was 24 years old. Oh, okay, so this is early okay. on. And, uh, you know, the course was in the mornings and the afternoons were sort of for homework and free time. And so I called up a bunch of the CEOs of Silicon Valley companies and said, hey, you know, can I come and see you? And I'd like to, you know, learn about what you're doing. And I don't know. Most of them said yes. So, so this is like 1988, right? Who are you 1989. calling? 1989. 1989, okay. Yeah. Who uh, are you calling? I, mean, I, I was calling Erwin Fetterman yeah, okay. and Jimmy Tribig and Andy Grove and Ken Oshman and a bunch of those guys. And they all said yes. So Andy Grove had you in? Yeah. And so, you know, you go see these guys and, well, you know, how do you manage your, a big company? And, and uh, you know, they... they, they would talk to me, right? <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, that was great. And I was doing everything I could to learn and, uh, you know, get help, right? Because, look, our, our business in the first eight years grew 80% per year. Mm. And for the six years after that, it grew 60% per year. So if you do the math with all that compounding, that's like, you know, tens of billions of dollars. Sure. And so, you know, we were quickly learning how to manage a much, much larger company. And it, and it changed many, many times as it, as it went from, you know, 100 people, 1,000, 10,000, 50,000. <laughs> when Steve Jobs was uh, a younger guy, I don't remember what the, whether it was Dave Packard or Bill Hewlett, he called up because he needed parts. You talk about coming to Silicon Valley to learn at Stanford and calling up CEOs and, and asking to come in and get that one-on-one -on -one coaching. Do young people do enough of that, making that bold ask? Because to a lot of people, that seems crazy. How am I going to call up Michael Dell and ask if I can come in and shadow him? I mean, granted, you had a company going that had some growth. You had some, uh, some cred behind you already. But do people make that ask enough? I certainly get lots of asks, so I'm, I'm not looking for any more, if that, if, that was, if that was your question. It doesn't have to be you specifically, but I'm sure people have, you know, their local CEO. Uh, do, do young, are young people bold enough? I'll go back to this theme I said earlier, which is I think actually people don't, they're, they're uh, less willing to take risks that they should in order to be successful. My mother told me in high school, you get 50% of what you ask for at one point. Trying to, sh trying to shift my mindset on the number of swings I took. And I still remember that. Yeah. I mean, is, is that what you're saying? People need to get up to bat more? I believe so. And, and I, think, I think, you know, too many people are not accessing anywhere near their potential because they don't want to make a mistake. Huh. How does that factor in to the way you communicate with Dell employees today? Well, we talk about risk in a, in a good way. And we talk about experiments and we have business plan competitions and we have new ventures that we start inside the company and we encourage those kinds of things because, you know, look, as companies get larger, you know, uh, risk can be like a dirty word. Oh, you know, risk committee, risk mitigation, you know. Uh, but, you know, risk and innovation absolutely go together. Hmm. And, you know, you're not going to have big innovations if you're not willing to take some risks. In the way that you approach your job and what it takes to kind of get your juices flowing creatively, are there things completely outside of work, hobbies, things that you do that give you a different perspective? You know, I like to, you know, read a lot. And obviously the Internet is amazing in terms of being able to 
have access to the world's information mm -hmm. in real time, you know, in enormous quantities. So, you know, I'm naturally pretty curious and love to learn. And so it's sort of a, you know, it, it never been a better time to be curious because you can you can learn an incredible, you know, amount. And and uh, to me, that's that's just endlessly exciting. Uh, it's also important to get enough sleep too. So so you know you, you can you can do too much of that. So you know, I, I I work hard to have what I think is a good balance in my life in terms of time with my family. Obviously, love what I do. Time to exercise and, and sleep. You know, and if you're going to do something for a long time, you better have a, a you know a a system to do it that is going to last. Right. So do you unplug, or are you one of those people like me who even on vacation? You kind of got your phone with you. You're not looking at it all the time, but you want to sort of manage. I have been with separation anxiety, right? And so, so if I if I'm not connected, I just don't feel good, right? <laughs> so, so I, I I I like to stay connected, but you know, it's important to relax and and have have uh, time to reflect and, and think for sure. You mentioned Kevin Rollins. There was a time when you handed over the CEO role. To him, to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Is that something you would do again? Ask me in five or ten years. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not something you'd be <laughs> contemplating today. It sounds like if you're don't, talking. Don't have any years. plans to do that. No. What did you learn from that experience? Well, you know, uh, it it, uh, it didn't didn't work out as everyone had had planned, and the board asked me to come back into the CEO role, and so I did, and. and uh, I, I was actively involved in the company dur dur during the whole time. So sure, your any, offices were right any, next to each other. That's right. Anything that happened there that that wasn't you know was was wasn't supposed to happen, you know I I take I take a, a big portion of the the blame or credit for it. So so what's the so what's the difference? What's the difference in having the founder CEO? Well, I think founders have a bit of special permission to make changes at at their companies. And maybe we're a pretty good test case for that because we keep changing things and evolving from from where we started. And uh, you know, look, I'll I'll care about this company after I'm dead. So you know, uh, it, it's just a different perspective in terms of time. And and uh, uh, you know, I've been been doing this for 33 years and still pretty young. Got a lot of energy and. Long way to go. That's pretty unique. I don't know how much you think about this, but you know, Larry Ellison stepped to the executive chairman role from this era of technology that continues to stretch, kind of the, the personal computing revolution into web, into mobile, into whatever we're moving into now. There are only so many founder CEOs left. Oh, I started when I was twelve. So, so you know, uh, you know, <laughs> not exactly. But, Nineteen, but, but, but okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. close to uh, twelve. I uh, started messing around with computers when I was twelve. Sure. Uh, but look, it's fun. It's interesting. I'd be bored if I wasn't doing this. But what does it mean to you to be still doing it? I mean, you started early. You're still, you know, you're back in the CEO role. The company's got your name on it. I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, Larry's still active at Oracle. Um, Bill Gates has taken a step back from Microsoft. You talk about uh, Andy Grove, you know, uh, he passed on and, and many people uh, ha have things to say about that, his incredible legacy. What does it mean to you at this point to still be in the game leading this company that you started? Couldn't imagine any other way, so, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, it, 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 is, it is the most interesting and exciting time in our industry when I step back and think about the explosion in the number of connected devices, the new computer science, uh, you know, the fifth generation cellular network, everything that's going on in, 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 in our world, you know, this would be like re the, absolutely the wrong time to, to not be in the center of things. <laughs> is there one technology or challenge 
or possibility that you see coming down the pike that you think is being undercovered, people aren't thinking about enough? You know, I think, I think uh, uh, it's difficult to answer that question. You know, the, there, I, I would not be surprised if there are some very significant breakthroughs in, in health as it relates to genomic data. Mm. And, you know, that's, that's incredibly interesting, especially when you think about uh, epigenetic expression and how computational resources can be used to unlock some of the mysteries there. So you know, in the health area, you know, the, the, the intersection between the information sciences and the biosciences, you know, that's a, that's a very, very interesting area. I think just the sheer amount of data across all industries, uh, th there, there will be big breakthroughs. And usually they're not so much technological as they are business model innovations on top of the, the new capabilities that are brought with all the things that we're talking about. So it's hard to predict the combinatorial inventions that are created in terms of business model uh, you know, downstream. Uh, and you know, we know that they'll be there. We don't know exactly what they will be. And to, to some extent, we don't even care, right? It's all good. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your philanthropy. You and your wife have a foundation. One of the areas where you focused is on urban youth uh, and opportunity. Tell me, are there things that you see happening there, uh, areas where people can, can make a difference that have had an impact on you? Yeah, I think there's sort of a, a new model of philanthropy emerging and sort of outgrew uh, from the results orientation and focus on return on investment and outcomes and data and results and success that, you know, you would find in a company like ours. And we've applied that to our philanthropic work and had some pretty remarkable successes in, for example, it, you know, education is, is one good one. So we started working in a number of the schools, some of the more troubled schools, and we found that they didn't really have any data, right? <laughs> and they, they weren't measuring things. And when they started measuring, there was no normative standard across measuring things so that you could actually benchmark them. And so imagine you know, running a massive organization with no data whatsoever. Mm. And so we created something called EdFi, which is now open source, it's public domain. I think we've got about 35 of the 50 states using it now. And it's a way to measure outcomes and success you know, at the school level, at the student level, you know, at the teacher level, and and uh, you know, uh, that's opened up uh, all sorts of possibilities in terms of how do you actually advance uh, outcomes and, and and success inside these some sometimes you know pretty challenged schools. It sounds like you're feeling pretty optimistic uh, about where the company, where the industry is headed. Yes, I am. What gives you that sense? Because uh, I know a number of people in, in Silicon Valley, yes, the stocks are doing well. Um, yes, there are still a lot of big ideas coming out, but it seems like mood-wise, people aren't so sure. Well, I'm excited because I see our customers excited <laughs> by what we're doing, and they're responding in you know, kind of business coming our way. So it, it's pretty easy to see that, that uh, you know, the, the things are working from that perspective. But when I step back more broadly and go and meet with some of these customers, you know, I met with a, a customer a few weeks ago in, in Europe, and they're creating about a billion new IP addresses every year. Mm. Internet of Things? It's not a computer company, right? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> uh, you know, right, they're, they're, they're making, it's, it's the Internet of Things. And they're using Pivotal as the operating system to be able to do that. And that's just one example. You look across all uh, you know, of, of the various sectors, 
the cost of making something intelligent is approaching zero dollars. And so the number of intelligent things is just exploding. And so then you layer on top of that this new computer science and you have sort of this Cambrian explosion of opportunity, the fourth industrial revolution. And America and, and so is... We're, we're, we are super excited about that. Is America well if, positioned if, if in you're, that? If you're not excited about that, you're dead or you're asleep. <laughs> is, is America well positioned in that writ large? I think it is. I think, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a time for software, right? It's a time for networks and, you know, semiconductors and technology. And, yeah, software is eating the world, but software doesn't run on software. <laughs> That's right. Right? Software runs on... Somebody's got to make the hardware. Somebody's got to make all this stuff. Yeah. That would be us, right? <laughs> so we're, 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 we're providing all the infrastructure for all of these things that are that are happening and we're seeing it. I mean, it, it, you know, the Internet of Things was sort of like an idea a few years ago. Now it's actually happening. And, and you know, we, we called it embedded intelligence and smart devices and things like that, you know, earlier on. And now we're actually seeing it in scale. Well, on that optimistic note, I got to say thanks for sitting down with CNBC with Fort Knox. It's been a great conversation. Thank you, Michael Bell. Sure thing. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.